Good morning, afternoon, or evening to folks tuning in from around the world. Welcome to the 135th episode of the IBM Kiskit Live Quantum Seminar Series. Uh, just a reminder that this seminar takes place every Friday at noon Eastern time and will be hosted on the Kiskit YouTube channel. You can always subscribe to go back and catch up on anything you miss, but you can only ask questions here live now during the seminar. I'm Derek Wong, a research scientist here at IBM Quantum, and I'll be your host today. And of course, there's a lot of care and effort that goes in these seminars, so I'd also like to thank our producers, Lako Manev, video producer, Paul Searle, and managing producer, Olivia Lanes. Today, we'll be hearing a talk by Dennis Rieger and Dennis Wilsch, who will speak about the observation of Josephson harmonics in tunnel junctions. Dennis Rieger is a PhD student at Karlsruhe Institute of Technology in Germany, and he studies granular aluminum circuits in strong magnetic fields. Dennis Wilsch is a postdoctoral researcher at the Ulich Supercomputing Center who models and benchmarks quantum information processors. Welcome and thanks for coming. Jan Pop will then introduce them briefly and then Dennis and Dennis will take it away. Excellent. Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Johan Pop, and I'm a joint professor at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology and at Stuttgart University in Germany. I would like to start uh, this um, presentation by acknowledging the various research groups that contributed to this um, relatively large collaboration for our field. So it all started with a joint research project between Forschungszentrum Jülich, so Research Center Jülich in, in English, um, and KIT under the Helmholtz um, umbrella, when we noticed that transmon uh, qubits with very standard Josephson junctions, like the one that you can see right here on, on the screen, um, cannot be accurate, surprisingly, I would add, cannot be accurately described um, by the standard Hamiltonian uh, of a simple cosine phi. So, at this point, we asked colleagues um, in the community to share their uh, similar, uh, similarly measured spectra with us, and we found similar results. So we are very happy to, to, to have had this, uh, this input. And we had to consider the hypothesis that a simple sine phi current phase relation for the junction might actually not be enough to accurately describe the measured spectra of um, superconducting artificial atoms. And with this remark, uh, I will hand it over to Dennis. Thank you, Johan, and hello, everyone. My name is Dennis Rieger, and it's my pleasure to start with the first part of our talk today. So I will introduce the main concepts and also will motivate why we should care about Josephson harmonics in our tunnel junctions and circuits. And the story is really at the heart of uh, the superconducting circuits community because the, the key object is, as Jon was showing already, a very conventional aluminum, aluminum, aluminum oxide, aluminum tunnel junction. So really just a standard SIS tunnel junction as shown here in this false colored SEM picture. And this kind of object of course has a very special place in our community because it has been considered so far as kind of a gold standard implementation of the purely sinusoidal current phase relation that you see here in this plot and that was predicted by Josephson in the 1960s. So that would imply that we can describe the charge transport across this structure in terms of just one single effective parameter, the critical current I see, and a purely sin sinusoidal dependence on the phase across the barrier. Now, my job in the next 15 minutes will be to convince you that uh, we actually expect and can experimentally observe corrections to that purely sinusoidal current phase relation in the form of harmonics, as shown here by this red line, and also by the shaded area, which gives the difference between the pure sine phi and the, the more sophisticated current phase relation. Now, having said that, it's very important to emphasize that a non-sinusoidal current phase relation would be absolutely no surprise if we would discuss any other type of junction. So for example, for, for point contact, so break junctions as shown here in the top left image, or for constrictions in otherwise continuous superconducting films, and also when the barrier is given by a semiconductor or a normal metal as shown here in the, in the bottom left, in any of these cases, 
we, uh, it, it's actually well discussed in the literature and very well expected that the current phase relation of these junctions is not just a sine phi. But what we address in, in the paper and in this talk today is the question if those harmonics can really be considered irrelevant also for tunnel junctions. So how would we, how would we test this idea or why would, why would we even come up with the idea that something is at odds with just using the sine phi? And uh, the best way to illustrate this is to actually show measurements where something does go wrong if we use this simple current phase relation. And we, what we can do is we embed our standard tunnel junction in one of the most simple circuits that we can come up with by shunting it with just a large capacitor as shown here in this optical image. And we get a transmon type or superconducting circuit. The corresponding circuit diagram would, would look like this with just two elements. And for this reason, we would only have one degree of freedom in the circuit, the phase across the junction. And we could write a, a very simple Hamiltonian with just two terms, the first corresponding to the charging energy of the pads and the second one given by the junction. So just as in the current phase relation, we have an IC sine phi. Here again, we just have one uh, parameter, one effective parameter, the Josephson energy Ej and the purely cosine phi dependence on the phase. So if we plot the energy landscape associated with this Hamiltonian, it would correspond to a phase particle living in this potential way, potential uh, uh, um, barrier uh, defined by the junction. And we get discrete energy levels inside this well, which would correspond to the eigenstates of this Hamiltonian. And since these transitions are in the gigahertz regime and we can measure them very accurately, uh, the transmon and especially the higher levels and the spectrum of the transmon is a very sensitive probe actually of this potential well given by the junction. So we can go ahead and, and do exactly that. We fabricate transmons and we measure the spectrum as precisely as we can, as many levels as we can, and then compare to, to the expected spectrum based on numerically solving the Hamiltonian down here. So here's the result for one transmon fabricated at KIT. And what I show in this plot is now actually the deviation between a model fit to the spectrum based on the Hamiltonian and the experimentally measured frequencies versus the transmon state transition. So what you can see with, by the red markers here is that the first two levels of course can be captured perfectly because we have two parameters in the Hamiltonian, the EC and the EJ. But then surprisingly, as John was hinting at already, the higher spectrum starts to deviate systematically and with increasing deviations from the expected frequencies. Now, maybe at this point it's just an outlier measurement. So let's test the same in, in different cooldowns of the same device. And as you can see, the deviations actually remain. So maybe it's just about this one KIT transmon. So that's why we ask our friends in the community to provide more transmon spectroscopy so for example, we have here in, in yellow uh, data measured in the group of Saki lectors in ENS Paris, and they even measured up to the sixth transition. And as you can see, we see the same kind of deviations in the tens of megahertz uh, systematically increasing. Uh, the same is true for data provided to us by Christian Dickel at the University of uh, Cologne. And uh, here again, at the third level, there's strong deviations from what we would probably call the standard uh, transmon Hamiltonian that we have here. So maybe there's one last hope at this point. It's just about the university transmons fabricated in university clean rooms. So we can take it to the next level and actually measure on a device from the industry. So in fact, from our host IBM. So here come more than 20 qubits from uh, the IBM Hanoi processor. And as you can see, once again, we have the deviation between the model and experiment starting at the third level and even more so for the fourth transition. So in summary, we can argue that the Hamiltonian that I've put down here fails to describe the spectroscopy of transmon devices across all of the community. And we can of course now consider additional terms in the Hamiltonian, for example, uh, the stray inductance here in the leads that uh, connect the junction to the large pads, or maybe additional modes that would be uh, present in the experiment but thanks to the simplicity actually of the transmon circuit, we can consider these terms and quantitatively rule out these additional contributions uh, 
and come to the conclusion that none of them can actually explain the measured deviations, especially not across all of these devices that we have considered. So, do you have, do you have a sense yet for why the uh, IBM devices have the opposite trend here? Or is that something you'll go into later? Uh, so I think uh, Dennis uh, Wilsch will touch on it briefly later in the talk, but I can um, give a, a simple explanation here directly. So in the end, it's uh, it's a combination of where the levels are in the potential and how the harmonics that uh, you will see later, how they influence it, uh, how they uh, change the potential at these positions where the, spectro where the spectrum probes the, the Josen potential. So at this point, after ruling out many other ideas and conclusions that we can come up with, uh, it actually brings us to the realization that we should uh, ask the question uh, if just a cosine phi is actually the correct thing to put, to put here in the Hamiltonian for, for the Josephson junction, or if we have to consider additional terms, right? So let's actually have a look at the uh, physics of a tunnel junction of the charge transport across such a, a structure. So here's a, a cross-section schematic of an SIS uh, junction with the two electrodes again color-coded. And in reality, we know that the, the charge transport across this barrier will actually be given by typically a large number of conduction channels in parallel, which contribute to the total current phase relation. Now, each of these channels will come with its own individual transparency, and we can borrow a standard result from the literature for this kind of, uh, of tunneling, uh, which tells us that indeed the current phase relation for an individual conduction channel does depend on the transparency of the channel and also has some more complicated dependence on the phase uh, than just the pure sine phi. So since this is still a, a two pi periodic uh, function, it makes sense to look at it in, in terms of a Fourier series as shown here. That's where we can nicely see the, the harmonics so sine phi, two phi, three phi, and so on with the corresponding Fourier coefficient in front depending on the transparency. Now to get a feeling for how these coefficients behave, so the magnitude of, of the harmonics in each channel, I plot here the relative magnitude of the, the Fourier coefficients normalized to the first one versus the order of the harmonic. And there's exactly three things which I really want to emphasize for this plot. The first is that the higher the order of the harmonic, the more the magnitude of the coefficient decays. And that's great news because it tells us that what we are expecting here is, are indeed corrections to the leading order sine phi. And uh, the higher the order, the less relevant uh, this contribution would be. The second observation is that the sign of the coefficient alternates between each order. So for example, the second harmonic would come with a relative minus sign compared to the sine phi. And now the third point, which is probably the most important one, is that how fast the harmonics decay is heavily depending on the transparency of the channel that goes into the current phase relation. So here in green, we see an example of what we would consider a, a very low transparency channel with transparency 10 to the minus six. And you can see that uh, in fact, the second harmonic is already at a level of 10 to the minus six or even seven uh, below the sine phi. And in this case, we would probably really consider uh, the, the harmonics irrelevant. And if all the channels in the junction would come with this low of a transparency, then we would go back to the basically pure sine phi uh, also for the full tunnel junction, right? However, it's the higher transparency channels as uh, given here an example of 10 to the minus two in red that will lead to measurable corrections in the current phase relation because the harmonics stay relevant uh, to much higher order. And with this knowledge now uh, uh, equipped for, for the single, uh, single channel um, current phase relation, we can ask ourselves, what would we now expect actually for the full current phase relation of the tunnel junction? And uh, we actually came up with a model for harmonics in, in the tunnel junction based on simple ingredients about the inhomogeneity of the barrier itself. So for example, if we look at a TEM picture, which was provided to us by Peter Schiffelgen uh, in Forschungs Centrum Jülich, then what we see on this kind of uh, atomic resolution um, pictures is that, yes, on average, the, the allox barrier 
would have a thickness of, let's say, about two nanometers. Um, but there's definitely variations around that average thickness uh, on the order of tens or 20 twenties of percent. So you can see um, atomic uh, scale uh, variations. The, there could even be uh, defects in addition or grain boundaries. So there's definitely an inhomogeneity around some average thickness of the barrier. And we can have uh, complementary evidence by, by doing molecular dynamic simulation, uh, which were uh, done by our collaborators in Cluj in Romania. And indeed, if you simulate the growth of an allox barrier, as shown here, already for one type of, of crystalline orientation, but even more so between the uh, two uh, orientations of an aluminum grain, uh, there's variations in thickness of the, uh, of the oxide here. Uh, in, in this process. And that's definitely something which is present uh, in, in, in allox barriers, at least grown by traditional shadow evaporation techniques. So based on these ingredients, our colleague Gianluci Catilani in Dulich came up with what we now call the mesoscopic model for harmonics in tunnel junctions. And it tells us that simply based on a Gaussian thickness distribution with about ten, tens of percent of standard deviation around an average thickness, we already expect a few percent of uh, at least the second harmonic in the current phase relation of a tunnel junction. So that's a very powerful intuition. And if we now go back to our measurements that I've shown uh, in the beginning of, of, the, of the talk, then at this point, it's actually almost no surprise anymore that we should see deviations, especially in the higher spectrum, from uh, our model if we just put uh, only one term, only a cosine phi in the Hamiltonian for our transmon. So instead, let's, let's make some room in this plot and introduce what, what we would call a model that considers the Jostan harmonics. And here I show now a, 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 a fit to the, to the data based on a model truncated at the fourth order. So including the cosine phi, two phi, three phi, four phi with the uh, corresponding EJs in front and fit that to the data. And what we get is a much better agreement with the measured spectroscopy. So it looks like Joseon harmonics help in, in modeling the, the transmon spectra. And uh, some of you might be already convinced now that uh, Joseon harmonics are a thing to consider. We have to include these terms in our models, uh, but others might be a bit skeptical here and say, of course, now when you introduce many more degrees of freedom in your model, you can capture more degrees of uh, freedom in your data, right? So basically it's now an almost perfect fit here up to the fourth level. And then again, we see a bit of deviations because we cannot capture these, right? And in, in this kind of, of scenarios, actually there's uh, a quite well-known um, phrase in, in our community or, or in science in general, which I would like to quote here because it's uh, particularly fitting in this case. And it goes back to John von Neumann who said, with four, four parameters, I can fit an elephant. And with five parameters, I can make it wiggle with its trunk. So that's a bit uh, how it looks like here for this particular case that I show. But um, uh, at this point, I would uh, like to conclude my part of the talk actually and hand over from one Dennis to the next Dennis. And uh, Dennis Wilsch will actually show you what we can confidently extract about the magnitude of uh, harmonics based on our measured data and what the implications of these terms are for transform qubits and beyond. Thanks, Dennis Rieger. Sorry, I have a quick question about that last part that you brought up. You said that there's some sensitivity, right, to this thickness coefficient. Is that only in that one case we have those strong deviations? If to the sixth case, zero to six, or do you see that the differences are also sensitive for the other devices? Um, so are you referring to the fact that the the ENS data here in yellow deviates at the fifth and sixth transition in this case? Or are, is it related to the mesoscopic model that I've shown on, on the previous slide? I'm wondering if other devices exhibit that kind of uh, deviation sensitivity. The, the the blue ones and red stars. Ah, you're saying if, if I would zoom in here, is there is there still a bit of remaining deviations basically for the yeah. devices? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I see. So uh, it depends on, on how exactly you do the fitting methodology. So 
of course, it is, if you look in detail, it is a question of the degrees of freedom that you have and uh, that you have in the model in comparison, right? Um, so generally, whenever there's uh, more degrees of freedom still in the data that you can capture in the model, there will be slight deviations remaining. And that's the case, um, uh, for example, also for uh, the, the current data where in fact we, we do fit to a large data set of many more um, uh, uh, spectroscopy uh, data points, and here it's uh, it's one uh, fit shown which represents um, the yeah the model um, for this particular uh, point, as Dennis will will show later also in in a frequency sweep. Um, so in general, I would say what we can conclude from from this model, which is just phenomenologically cut at at the fourth order, is that it is a much better fit. Uh, but it's not expected that it can perfectly capture all the um, also fine deviations that remain, because uh, generally speaking, we would expect that um, the harmonics are, are a fingerprint of a very large number of uh, channels and transparencies, and there's basically no chance to capture it only with a very, very few degrees of freedom uh, perfectly, right? Yes. So well, thanks for the question, and I will hand over to Dennis. Yeah, so hello also from my side. Uh, I'm the other Dennis, and I'm presenting the second part of this talk. So in the first part, we have exposed the harmonics. So we've seen that these uh, Josephson harmonics are there. And my part of the talk is now to convince you to embrace these harmonics. In particular, we will see what they actually are, the, the magnitude, and even more importantly, maybe, what impact these Josephson harmonics can have, already have on present devices and maybe on future superconducting quantum computers. So, okay, we previously saw that if we include some of these EJM coefficients, we can model the data. But the first question is now, what are these EJM coefficients? So here I'm going to plot the uh, EJM coefficients, index uh, m on the x-axis, ej2 will be here, and I'll plot it in relation to the first Josephson energy. And the scale is from 0.01% to 100%, and we've already seen that there is one model which can describe the data very well that we have measured. Uh, the question is now, is this the only model that can describe our experiment? And to answer this question, what we do is the following. We scan on purpose all higher EJs, EJMs, up to EJ10, and then solve the inverse problem to see what EJ2, EJ3, and EJ4 come out. So note that this is not overfitting, uh, but we intentionally try to distill the maximum possible information on EJM that we can say given our measured data. So we did this and we got this model. Uh, we also got this model. God's got a, a fourth model. And we got this model. And um, so what we then did is we went ahead and took the GPUs of our supercomputing system and did the full scan, like the exhaustive scan, to get the full information on the EJM. And this is how we come up with these bars. So they tell us, for instance, that for this device, and this is the KAT device in the third cooldown, uh, EJ2 has to be a one, uh, above 1%. One so there is no model uh, that can describe the data with an EJ2 that vanishes or is below 1%. And we can also use this full range of models to check our mesoscopic model. Uh, the mesoscopic model of, the, of tunneling through an aluminum oxide barrier, which Dennis already introduced in the first part. And um, as expected, it, it lines very well uh, in, within these bars. And uh, the mesoscopic model is very nice because the mesoscopic model predicts all these harmonics um, as a function of only two parameters. And then the parameters are physical parameters, namely the average barrier thickness, d bar, which in the stem image would be this thickness here, and a standard deviation. So it expresses the inhomogeneity that we from physics, from the first part of the talk, already expect. And what comes out is um, the meaningful quantities of d bar is 1.6 nanometers, which matches well with what we uh, what we have in the stem image here, and a standard deviation of 0 0.4 nanometers. Um, so we did this procedure of scanning or distilling the maximum information of the harmonics for all our samples, and we get this picture. So here we see the kit uh, sample in the first, second, and third cooldown. 
we see the NS sample. We see uh, one data set for the current sample. More data is, is to come. And we see a uh, qubit zero of the IBM Hanoi device, which already looks very particular here. And we will understand what that means and also the implications it has on quantum computing quantities uh, as the talk unfolds. So um, by, I mean, let me stress this. Uh, the most important part of this plot is actually not where the bars are, but where they are not. So this tells us that for all of these um, samples across many laboratories around the world, there is no sample which can, can be described with a vanishing EJ2 or EJ3, for instance. And um, so we've understood now that we have to consider these harmonics um, and that they shift our levels. But um, there is one very important aspect um, for transmon qubits. And this brings us now uh, to the implications. So um, for transmon qubits, uh, one of the most important aspects is the charge dispersion, which has an immediate consequence for uh, the coherence of our superconducting qubits. So we look at this now. What is the charge dispersion? So the charge dispersion means that if we look very closely at these level transitions, we see that they are not constant. So we see that they change a bit. And um, when the transpon was initially proposed, this was fine. I mean, it's, it's very low. But uh, in the meantime, given the precision that we've reached in the lab, this becomes relevant. And you also see it also happens for the qubit transition. So in the computational subspace. And this is exactly what we call charge dispersion. So charge dispersion is the maximum deviation that we can find between these different frequencies that this uh, transition takes. Um, and this is actually, so physically what happens between these two is um, there is a quasi-particle tunneling through the junction, which makes the frequency jump uh, on the scale. And this happens on the order of milliseconds. So this is actually relevant for all uh, our quantum computers at the moment. And then there is a second effect, which means, uh, which is that, the, that these uh, background charges make the charge dispersion drift. So maybe sometimes it will jump between these two points. Sometimes it will jump between these large points. And this changes on the scale of minutes. So this is the charge dispersion. And um, what's very important for us now is that we know from theory that the charge dispersion is exponentially sensitive in the model parameters. So we can use this as an exponentially sensitive test of our Joseph harmonics hypothesis. So uh, we took, we used the device uh, of Cologne, which is actually a controllable, it's a squid that we can control by magnetic fields. And um, we can, as a function of the qubit frequency that we can tune from uh, here shown 3.5 gigahertz to six gigahertz, we can get many of these data sets, one of which actually was shown in the first part of the talk. And um, then we can take these data sets for many different magnetic fields and plot uh, the charge dispersion, which we can also measure. So these are really measured data points and then see whether the standard model prediction can also reproduce this. And as it turns out, uh, which we might have already expected so far, it cannot. So the standard model, the simple cosine phi Hamiltonian, um, underestimates the charge dispersion by a factor of two to seven. So in other words, this means that we, we fabricate our transmon, we expect to have a charge dispersion that's rather low, but in the lab, we get a charge dispersion, which is a factor of two to seven higher. So which has a factor of two to seven less coherence, at least if it's limited by T2. And we can now, we can now test our Josephson harmonics model and we see it, can predict the charge dispersion very nicely, so it aligns very well with the measured data. Um, now, an important question when we see this is, and we've seen this uh, also for all the other devices at KIT and ENS, so the university transmon, so to say, uh, we see it always goes up. So the question is, does the charge dispersion always get worse, or is the, is the coherence actually always worse than what we expect from theory? And interestingly, this is not the case, and here we have evidence from the IBM transmons. So here I show the qubit zero, qubit one, and qubit two of the IBM Hanoi device. Again, the standard model prediction of the charge dispersion shown in dashed lines. And then the harmonics model charge dispersion is uh, massively lower. It's actually for, for qubit two, it's almost a factor of 10. So it's um, for some of them, it's an order of magnitude reduction in charge dispersion 
which actually also um, agrees with measured data for T2 that we have for this device. And the question is now, can we understand this? Can we understand why the charge dispersion always goes up for these transmons and why it always is better in the lab than what we expect from theory for these uh, IBM transmons? And for this, we have to take a closer look at what the harmonics actually are. So here I have now added to this bar plot um, two more qubits. So it's the qubit one and qubit two in here. And we've already seen that these IBM qubits, they uh, have to be described as a very large set of harmonics. By the way, they are uh, very close to the upper limit and the upper limit would be a maximum transparency of T equals one, uh, which for a single channel, we would call a quantum point contact. Um, so to understand what actually reduces the charge dispersion, let's take a closer look at qubit zero here. So here I plot the EJM coefficients for qubit zero. And um, we see in comparison the what would correspond to the standard model, the homogeneous uh, low transparency barrier. And if we plot then the potential um, for these two cases, we get this. So the standard model potential is shown in blue here, it looks like this. And the potential we would get if we take this EJ2, this EJ3 and this EJ4 cosine M5 into account, we see that it's much higher. And it's actually the height of this potential which reduces the charge dispersion, the same way as the charge dispersion is exponentially sensitive to the model parameters. So we can quantitatively compute this height, and we see that the main correction to the height of the potential comes from EJ3. So it's actually this uh, large EJ3 that we have uh, observed, which reduces the charge dispersion so massively, and which then in turn also increases or improves the qubit coherence so drastically. Uh, so this is one very important aspect for transmon qubits. Now, regarding applications, there is, uh, for instance, another very important aspect for transmon qubits, and this is the unharmonicity. So the unharmonicity is the deviation of the 1-2 transition from our qubit transition. Uh, it's called alpha, and if it's uh, very low, so if they're very similar, then our quantum gates can could suffer from leakage errors, which would make our quantum gates much shorter, uh, much, much, much worse for short quantum gates and also more erroneous for longer quantum computation. Um, so what would we have to do with these Josephson harmonics here to improve also the unharmonicity? So what we need for the unharmonicity to grow would be to draw this level two closer to the bottom, for instance, with a potential like this. So we want the potential is slightly, uh, just a little bit wider around the two transition um, to draw this yellow level to the bottom. It doesn't look much here, but it is much as we will see in the following. And the question is uh, how to do this. And it turns out that very simply, we can do this by tweaking the EJ4. So the EJ4 is exactly the corresponding with which uh, the coefficient, which makes this potential a little bit wider. And uh, even though it doesn't look like much here, Let's show how large it actually is. So in this 2D chart, uh, I show the, the standard transmon model corresponding to the blue line, which has a massive over uh, estimation of the charge dispersion at 80 kilohertz. It's not what we observe. And the harmonics model prediction, which uh, reduced charge dispersion. Now the unharmonicity is shown on the x-axis here. And if we could just tweak EJ4 a little bit, we could almost double the unharmonicity to 600 megahertz here, which would be a massive improvement for quantum gates. Um, so now we've seen two important uh, complic uh, two important consequences that uh, that engineering or, or tuning these harmonics might have. The big question is now, how can we experimentally do this? And here we have a few uh, ideas. One very obvious idea, also uh, from from the first part of the talk, would be to shape the channel transparency. So We've seen that for high transparency, high transparency conduction channels, the EJM coefficients go to this upper limit here. So by shaping these channels, uh, we could bring them up here. Another, um, another idea, another level we have is by adding inductive elements. And we have this in the supplement of the, of the corresponding paper, where we show that also by adding stray inductances and tuning stray inductances, which is very easy experimentally, we can have a direct influence on these EJM coefficients. And then a very strong lever we could have, 
is with a flux bias because theoretically if we have a, a split transpon um, at the bottom sweet spot and the top sweet spot so depending on the magnetic fields i put through this transpon um, we can have constructive or destructive interference of these EJM coefficients. So this is how we would move, for instance, level four down here, even though we would expect this to go something like this maybe. And, and then there's a very beautiful idea which has just uh, recently appeared on the archive by Boskred et al, where they um, specifically engineer these EJM coefficients by using networks of high transparency JJs. So there is a lot of potential for harnessing these harmonics to improve our superconducting qubits. So um, summarizing, let me briefly uh, recap what we've seen. So in the first part of the talk, we have exposed the Josephson harmonics. We see that we have to consider them. So the natural consequence is that we should include these harmonics in all of our established models and the theories and the proposals that we have for qubits. And similarly, we should reevaluate our experimental data to see if we can uh, observe these harmonics also there. And then as the second uh, part of the talk showed, we should go ahead and engineer and harness these harmonics, try to get control over these harmonics because they give us a very strong lever to tune our qubit uh, properties. And we've seen the charge dispersion, which directly affects the qubit coherence. And we've seen the unharmonicity, which directly affects the quantum gates. So with this, I'd like to conclude. Um, we would encourage everybody to go look for these harmonics, try to engineer and harness the power to advance superconducting quantum computing. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much for the talk there. Um, I think we have quite a few questions actually, if we can all stick around and um, ask those. Is that all right with you guys? Yeah, sure. Okay. Great. Um, so one of the questions that came up in the chat was, okay, so now we know that there uh, are these deviations. How can we change our device fabrication to minimize these deviations if we want them to be closer to that original model that we had? Do you guys have any proposals for that or are there thoughts in the field about this? Yes, uh, this was actually um, what we also thought in the beginning should be the goal. Uh, so we saw from the mesoscopic model also that we get a very close uh, sine phi current phase relation if we have a very homogeneous barrier. So we try to get um, no uh, deviations in the boundaries, very low transparency homogeneous barrier. And then we would try to get close to the slower limit. And it's actually not impossible that maybe some of these transforms that we find out there are in this limit, but all of the data we've analyzed from published spectroscopy in the past has not shown this. So mm -hmm. um, that would be one idea. But the important thing is maybe as a consequence of this research, maybe this is not the only goal. So maybe it is indeed better to harness these harmonics as we've seen for the for the IBM qubits, which have been engineered in some way to have a reduced charge dispersion. And now we know how we might be able to maybe also for tuning the harmonicity to use these harmonics to go in the other direction. So the homogeneous low transparency limit might not be the ultimate goal. That makes sense. So you brought this up briefly in your response just now, but um, some of these deviations seem quite large, right? And I'm guessing that when people measure devices, they do want to measure 0, 1, 0, 2 all the way up a bit. So why don't you think that similar deviations were like noted more explicitly in the literature before? Or maybe if they were, why wasn't this study basically done before as transmons have been around for quite a few years now? Yes. Um, so if you if you looked at past uh, studies, and we've also examined a lot of them, um, you see that very often uh, they fit the qubit transition um, and maybe the charge dispersion or the zero two transition. And if you have only these two quantities, you can perfectly well describe them with a the standard transmon model. And this is the point where many would be content depending on what the initial goal was, right? So it's actually this going beyond the status quo and pursuing these deviations and trying to understand them, which led us in, in this direction. And in fact, if you, and there are not many, but if you can, if you analyze published spectroscopy from the past, you can also find these deviations. And we've also heard already from the community, from other uh, researchers who have reanalyzed the data that also they are looking out for the harmonics now, and most likely they will be there. So the deviations will probably be there. Got it, okay. And um, can these harmonics improve other superconducting qubit architectures as well? Or 
do you think that what you found that uh, trans ones would be most sensitive to this kind of deviation? So trans ones are uh, sensitive, definitely, because the charge dispersion is one huge factor. Um, we expect that in principle, I mean, this is just an SIS tunnel junction, right, for which we have seen this. So in principle, it should have consequences for other devices. But this is also one part uh, where very important future research is necessary. Um, for instance, we know for uh, fluxonium qubits, and I know that uh, Dennis has looked at this briefly, um, the situation might be different. I don't know. Do you want to comment on this, Dennis, or? Well, I would argue that um, we should go check, actually, uh, and, and it has to be done still, um, how well how we can expose these harmonics in other types of circuits. And for a fluxonium, you would, for example, need a very precise uh, spectrum versus external flux, which is actually not trivial to take because usually away from the sweet spots, uh, you get a lot of flux noise, which then broadens the, the line width typically. Um, so what I'm saying is that uh, we definitely expect them to be there in any kind of circuit that uh, involves uh, standard tunnel junctions. And it's not exactly clear about the, what the consequences would be, uh, but we have to go check in, in detail for each individual um, type of device. Great, makes sense. Um, and so in the last slide, you started touching on, you know, using these and engineering them for to improve devices. Do you have a sense for like the quantitative improvement you could expect to see in, for example, a T1, T2 or the gate fidelity based on increasing the anharmonicity and other factors like you suggested? Yeah, so um, for the anharmonicity, for instance, um, okay, it's it's very bad if it's, uh, if it's very low, um, but say if it's, uh, which by standard it would be at 300 megahertz. So if you double this, if you bring it to 600 megahertz, um, this would already um, would greatly improve, probably more than uh, make your gates twice, gates twice as shorter with the same error rate, because you would just not excite the 1-2 transition if you drive the 0-1 transition as much. Um, as for the charge dispersion, yes, so if we see, uh, for instance, the Cologne device with a factor of 2 to 7 difference, um, this uh, has a direct consequence on the dephasing times, and then you could have your coherence limited by T2 already. Um, and if you go in the other direction, uh, as you've seen for the IBM qubits, where we see from 80 kilohertz to 20 kilohertz, which agrees very nicely also with which, uh, what we've heard from uh, from T2 measurements, um, I think this. I think you could push both in the direction that you would be limited by another factor. And then maybe for transpons, a third ingredient might be limiting your qubit properties. Actually, we have we have uh, evidence that readout is also influenced uh, is in a lot by these harmonics. So as it shifts the levels, you will have more crossing. Single shot readout is probably very difficult. And for instance, so there's a lot of there's a lot of implications also still to, to see. Got it. I also want to ask a question about this mesoscopic model, um, because when you think about applications, you need to be able to control this uh, thickness and this deviation of the uniform thickness, right? And so do you have a sense for the limits of this model? Like what is the maximum deviation or the minimum maximum thicknesses that can be considered where this effect still dominates the harmonics versus other effects, let's say? Yeah, so in, in this model, um, which I, I should stress is uh, right, quite simple, it's a Gaussian variation of the thickness. But um, if you have this Gaussian variation, then this model can also um, describe very large thicknesses, for instance. The, the only important thing would be the ratio of the standard deviation to the barrier thickness. And if the standard deviation comes close, say if you fit this to the data, right? And if the standard deviation that comes out is on the same order as the average barrier thickness, then you know your model is probably physically unreasonable. You would get large harmonics then, of course, but this would be the point uh, where the model would tell you, make it more sophisticated, maybe consider a trapezoidal barrier model. There are these ideas, of course, out there, um, and then test it. But for all our devices, um, so uh, for the university transponds, it just describes it very well. Okay. And this might be a little bit out of your guys' knowledge and definitely out of mine, but I'm wondering these ratios, like how much control do people really have in creating the you know different barrier thicknesses? Yes, so this is probably always the point where uh, 
the way it's very simple for theoreticians to, mm -hmm. to do this, right? It's just change a number. We've seen this nice, uh, beautiful proposal by Boscord et al, where they um, propose some Fourier engineering by having networks of JJs, of high transparency JJs. Certainly, I guess it's possible to have high transparency conduction channels. Uh, we've also seen experimental studies who show suppressing charge dispersion for high transparency conduction channels. So, um, I mean, there's there's a huge variety of directions where you could go trying to engineer it. Uh, not, not possible for us to uh, foresee all of this, but we do have some ideas. I okay. don't know, Dennis, do you want to extend? Okay. Yes. But but we've seen we've seen similar things also in the magnesium oxide uh, community that they've moved away from uh, from the uh, from from uh, the aluminum oxide um, just because of such problems. Got it. All right. Well, thank you so much. That was uh, really great. I learned a lot there. I hope the audience did too. So thanks for coming. And of course, a big thanks to the audience for tuning in. Um, just a reminder, like this video, subscribe to the Kiskit YouTube channel, and we'll see you next week.